talk about service and serving. And uh, I just got to tell you, um, probably, uh, probably one of the biggest and most wonderful uh, blessings that God has given to me, um, every one of my kids still serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's not anything that we done correct or whatever, I don't think. I think it's just God somehow shined his blessing on our kids. And, uh, and, and I, I, I just want to give him thanks for that, to, yes. to be able to see her up here singing. And I know Troy is serving in Florida. Alyssa is serving in Texas. My kids are everywhere. They didn't like us, but they love the Lord. So <laughs> no, they, they moved all over the place. Uh, but they're all doing just, just wonderful things for the Lord. The central passage for uh, this message Sunday comes out of Matthew. Matthew 20, 28, uh, 20, 28. And it says this. The Son of Man did not come into this earth to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. So the, the whole ideal, if we're going to be Christ's way... If we're going to do things Christ's way, then we got to serve. We don't have any choice. If you're going to be a member and a Christian in the midst of something, he called us to serve. Now, we're not all going to serve in the same capacity. God did not design us like that. We're all different. We all have different skills, abilities. We all have different traits or things within us. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about our shape that I talked about a long time ago. Uh, seems like a long time ago when I did the, the basket thing. Um, and you took the tests and you took all, remember that? All online stuff. You got your M&Ms. You had to go in there and you had to fill out the little thing. If you need it, I can probably find the m and somewhere, but they're probably pretty stale by now. But that's okay. Um, but we found out, you know, what kind of makes us tick, what we like, what we don't like. As we begin uh, this Lenten season and we're going to celebrate Easter in just a little bit. There is a uh, video that we're going to play, and I'm just going to set back down. And uh, I was supposed to set back down before I came up here, but I got so much into the music that I forgot how I prepared the lesson. So I'm going to sit down now and not make Sherry back, Shelly back there going, What is he doing? I'm supposed to play the video. Uh, I'm going to get her back on track, and I'll be right back up here. <laughs> So we as, um, maybe not as, as a liturgical type church, 
sometimes we hear the words Lent and we go, oh, that's a Catholic thing or that's a Lutheran thing or that's a, some type of what, what theologically we call the high church. That's a high church. You know, we're low church. <laughs> um, but there is such a profound thing about Lent. Lent is all about giving up something. Now, you can't give up Brussels sprouts, all right? If you don't like Brussels sprouts, you know, you, I'm giving up Brussels sprouts for Lent. Yeah, well, you, you don't like them anyway. That doesn't work. <laughs> there you go. It's really, I'm going to give up something that I desire. Some people give up social media. Boy, would that be difficult. Some people give up... Uh, <laughs> The kids are all waving at me. Never mind. I'm sorry. It's my ADD. So uh, <laughs> they're walking by. Uh, some, some people give up. I had a lady give up uh, soda one time. She was like, she drank, uh, I think it was, what was it, Coke or something, every day. And she gave that up. She goes, oh, you didn't believe how hard that was for me to give that up. And, and, and in that time, whenever you give up something that you absolutely desire for this it's a 40 days Lent's 40 days when you give that up when you desire that that's to trigger your mind it's kind of like a wedding band that reminds us hey you're married remember your wife love the girl um it's kind of like that it reminds us that we love christ right and the suffering and everything that that happened that he did for us around easter as, he, as we suffer through that period of missing our Coke or missing our Dr. Pepper or whatever it is you're, you're, you're going to give up, you reflect on what Christ gave up for you. And it's the focus as we go into the Easter season on that very thing. I love Lent. I love the symbol behind Lent. Um, I love being able to, to kind of to focus on that. Some may give up TV. Could you imagine that? What will we do? We may have to talk to our spouse. How horrible would that be? Anyway, <laughs> as you give up, so think about that. Think about celebrating Lent with us uh, or, or this Easter season. Maybe you've never done it before. I challenge you to do it. You'll, you'll be surprised just how much of an impact it have on you. So uh, as we get back on track, <laughs> let me read our mission statement. Christway is a Christ-centered, community-focused church that is led by the Holy Spirit with a heart to see others come into a relationship with Jesus. Christway is committed to use its resources to intentionally grow the kingdom of God, care for others, and invest in people through serving our community, trusting God, and being a witness to a lost and desperate world. Christway will authentically love and yield our way to Christ's way. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 20, or I'm sure that they'll probably be up on there on the screen too. Um, and we're going to look over this passage. Like I said in the beginning, the central point is the end of this, the 28th verse, where it says that Christ did not come into this earth to be served, but to serve. And that's been what I, I can tell you with, with all honesty, that has been what I've desired and tried the most to do with my children, is to show them a servant attitude. I've taken them out on the street with us when we did street ministry. They have built uh, shelters with us when we were doing that. They have, they have fed. They have done block parties for little kids in the middle of nowhere. We have dragged them everywhere and... They have, and she probably will say amen really loud. And, uh, but, but we have had an attitude of service with our kids. And we have, we have served. And we try to teach that and embedded that within them and, and who they are as people. Now, this passage, uh, I'm going to read it and uh, you can follow along. Then the mother of Zebedee, the son, came to Jesus with her sons. And kneeling down, asked him for a favor. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these sons of mine will set at my right hand, the other on my left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? <laughs> we can, they answered. 
Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And their high officials exercised authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be greatest among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we begin to expound upon these verses, as we begin to dig in and we begin to apply and look at them, Father, I pray that you will illuminate what we need to hear. Father, I don't want anyone here to hear what I have to say. Father, I'm a fallen man. You know that. I got struggles. I got trials. They don't need to know what I need to say. But they need to know what you need to say. So, Father God, I pray that you hide me behind the cross so that they hear you clearly and only you. And we just pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So my mom was the ultimate servant. At least I thought so. Uh, so my, my, my mom and dad raised 21 kids. I'm 21 of 21. So there's a lot of kids. And when my mom would cook, she would like prepare all the food. She'd put it out there. She would, everybody would, would eat and, and just, you know, and then whenever it was done, she would clean up and she would put all the dishes away. Everybody would clear out of the kitchen. She would take her food then, which didn't make sense because it was cold, but she would take her food then. She would sit down at the table and she would eat her food. I thought, man, what a servant. My mom, my mom served her family. She loved her family. Later on in life, um, I'm telling my mom just what, a, what an impact she made on me by just watching her serve her family. My mom goes, it wasn't about that. I go, what? She goes, there's so many of you, it was chaotic at the table. I just wanted to eat in peace. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it, it's interesting, isn't it? That all this time I thought, oh, my mom was just this amazing servant. And there's a hidden agenda behind it. <laughs> Moms want the best for their kids. They really do. I mean, they just do. They, they want to set an example. They want to care for their kids. They want, they want to do just great things. And here the mother in the story. She says that, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand, the other at your left. And Jesus says, man, you don't know what you're asking. I mean, did you, did you hear what I said right before, before this verse? Like, it, you're talking, there, there's a cup that they're going to have to take. And I don't, I don't think you know what, I, what I'm saying. And can you drink from the cup I'm about to drink? And he's referring to Matthew 17 through 19. And it says this, And Jesus was going to Jerusalem. He took the twelve disciples aside. And on the way he said to them, See, we are going into Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will be condemned to death. They will condemn him to death. And deliver him over to the Gentiles. To be mocked, to be flogged, to be crucified, and he'll be raised on the third day. <laughs> you sure you want that cup? Like, if you're going to drink from the cup that, I'm, that we're talking about, your sons, you sure your sons want to go through that? You sure they want to go through being mocked, flogged, crucified? You sure you sure want that to happen? And they said, oh yeah. Yeah, the kids answered back, oh, we're willing. And they did. So James and John are the inner circle, right, of Christ. James, John, and Peter, that's kind of the ones that got to see the transfiguration. They were all the big events, you know. They were there. Whenever it was the smallest group, then, then was the three. James and John's are brothers. They're the sons of Zebedee. Um, and their, their dad owned a fishing business, probably helped support the ministry. And his mom, wanting the best for him, says... Can you have one of my sons sit at your right and one sit at your left? Um, 
You know something they're missing? Where's Peter? Like if one sets at your right and one sets at your left, what about Peter? He's in the inner circle too. I have noticed anytime we do favoritism, somebody gets left out. Somebody feels worse, you know? It's kind of like whenever you have three kids or more, you know, someone's going to be left out. There's only two of you, you, you know. It, I just told all my kids they were my favorite <laughs> behind their back, you know, so no one else would know. But, uh, but, but any time that we do that, the one's going to be left out. And she says, do you, are you sure, are you sure that you want to do this? By the way, tradition, do you know what happened? James is the first martyr. We know that. It's an axe. He's the first one. Herod kills him. We, we see that one. John is uh, put on the island of Patmos. Do you know how they tried to kill John, by the way? According to tradition, they tried to boil him alive. But he didn't boil. God protected him. It, it's, a, it's, it's in the tradition. So, are you sure you want to do this? You know, every one of the, every one of the disciples, there, there are stories. If you, if you look, it's not in the scripture, but as we look through scripture, we find out every one of them was killed for the faith. Every one of them drank this cup. Uh, Peter was crucified upside down in Rome, according to tradition, right? So every one of them was going to have to do this. Uh, it says, so my first point is, is simply this. If we choose to serve, we serve no matter what. No matter what the cup may come, no matter what the difficulties may be ahead of us, even when things are not going right, we still have to serve. We still have to put that effort forward. Even whenever people don't appreciate us, we still have to serve. And that's a miserable. I hope you don't work in an environment where you don't get appreciated, where people don't tell you how grateful they are for you. Um, I've, I've been in environments like that, and it's just no fun to work in a place like that. Um, and if you're a, a leader of a business or you're a manager, praise your people. Praise in public. You know, talk to them about what they need to change in private. But make sure that you praise your people. Remember that, that James and John were, were two of the most probably loyal of all the, the disciples and Peter along with them. And the mom's request isn't something outside of the perspective. You know, you would think that. I mean, look at them. They have been so loyal to you. They have been your, your inner core this whole time. Make sure it's that way in heaven also. Can you do that for me, Jesus? And Jesus says, listen, man, you don't, you don't know what you're asking. Like, to be able to be at that level, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a cup that they're going to have to drink that is not a very pleasant one. Are you sure? This is what you want me to ask. And yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what we want. He said, listen, they may be delivered over. They may be condemned to death. They may be crucified. They may be mocked. They may be flawed. Matter of fact, they would be, all these things. And they said, yeah, I'm willing to do it. I think it's normal, I think, um, to want the best for your kids and to brag on your kids. If you haven't noticed, I, I do that a lot. I am very proud of my kids. I really am. I have, I have great kids. Um, I wouldn't trade them for most of yours. Maybe some of yours, but not most of yours. <laughs> no, I wouldn't trade them for anything. They, they are amazing. And I think that's normal for us to brag and want us to have the, the, the most for them. But I don't think that we need to place our kids above other kids and say, my kids are superior to your kids. Or that this is that. And sometimes with favoritism, that's what kind of happens. We need to bring people in and love, and love them all together. So are you able to drink this cup? Yeah, yeah, we're able to do it. We're, we're able to do this. Do you understand what you're asking? There, there, there's, man, if you choose to do this, there are some consequences down the road. Are you sure you're ready? I think we talked about the parable, right, today in, in, uh, in Life Group. Uh, of the sower and how some went on good, some went on rocky, some went on the path and how some grew up. And I think about that whenever I think about people that decide to go on this Christian walk. You know, it's not going to be a, a free ride. 
you're going to go through difficulties and trials. You know, the Bible says that you're going to have life and have it more abundantly. And life's a roller coaster. Think about that in abundance. But that's what the Christian walk is like. If you get highs are high, like you wouldn't believe, and the lows are miserable, like you wouldn't believe. There's a cup that you're going to have to drink if you choose to follow this. And then Jesus said to them, verse 23, you will indeed drink of my cup, but to sit at my right and left, I don't have the right to do that. Only my father can grant that place. You're going to do it. You're going you're to drink this cup, and there's things that are going to happen. But she, he says after that, it's, it's not my place to choose. I'm not going to choose. And I'm especially not going to choose in front of all these other people. Um, and just the, the reason that they did that uh, began to build dissension with the other ones. My second point is this. Know your limits. <laughs> know your limits when you choose to, to serve. You cannot give what you're not called to give. Can I say that again? You cannot give what you're not called to give. Too many times we say there's a need. And if I don't do it, nobody will do it, right? If I don't do this, it's just going to fall by the wayside. Nobody's going to do it. And we end up putting ourselves in a position that we were never called to. And the actual person that was called to it can't get in it because you're standing in it. Sometimes we jump into everything because we know it needs to be done, right? I'm that way. I'll, I'll do things I know I'm not called to just because uh, if I don't do it, no way you're going to do it. Um, and we don't do a very good job when we're in a place where God doesn't want us to be. So we, we got to know our limits. If we forget that, we think we got to do everything. And we become a martyr. Not only are we a martyr, we're going to let everybody else know we're a martyr. <laughs> because I'm doing this, nobody else is going to do this. I'm, when you serve in a place that God has called you, you won't be a martyr. You'll be excited. You'll be like, man, I get to do this, we're doing this, we're all about this. this is, you're, you're just excited. When you're in a place where you're not supposed to be, you take on the martyr, you know, and it's, I just hate him. Nobody else will go. And I wish someone else would do this. And da, da, da. Okay, step aside. Oh, no, 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 no. No, I, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. Okay. Um, are you where God wants you to be? <laughs> is, this, is this, you know, because you'll have joy about that. Um, my, my third point is um, pursue greatness in everything that you do. Don't, don't pursue mediocrity. Don't just fill a position because a position needs to be filled. Pursue greatness. Make the most out of it. In verse 25 it says, But Jesus called them and said to them, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. It's kind of backwards. And whoever is first among you must be your slave. So how do you become great? You serve. I will guarantee you, and I know this, and Jackie can back me up on this because she does the homeless ministry too. We, we take people out, and when, once they serve for the first time, it will be the most joyous time you'll ever have in your life. You'll come back and you'll just be excited about it and excited about being able to make a difference. And, and there's many things that we do like that. When we go out and we begin to serve, people think that they can acquire and it'll bring happiness. And it never does. Giving brings happiness. Serving brings happiness. Being served is awkward, right? And, and some, some people like, you know, you go, through, you go through a health problem and people start serving you and at first you're grateful and then you just kind of feel like, okay, I feel like really awkward right now. You're grateful for it, but, but there's an awkward to it. But the people that are serving, how wonderful is that? By the way, I just got a call uh, from the trustee's son and he wants to thank you. He called me up to thank you. He says, you have no idea 
what difference you've made to my parents. He's in Michigan. He can't, he's, he's so far away, and they're going through this. And he is so excited and so just blown away by the church. So I just want to share that with you. Sometimes I get these things, and you never hear about it. Um, but you've been taking care of them. And by the way, in May, they'll celebrate 90 years. They're, they're both, they're both of their, their uh, um, birthdays are like, like, what, three days apart? Yeah, 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 it's coming. So they're, they're, we're going to have a 90-year birthday party for them here. That's, that's my goal. It's kind of off, off track a little bit, but we're going to celebrate that together. We're going to celebrate their 90 years. It, it'll be fun, and, and his son and I talked about that. But serving one another brings great, great joy. In Matthew 6, 3, it says what? Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. So service is not something that you get praised for. It's just something that you do. And, and it says if, if you do it to get praise, your reward is here. If you do it, your, your reward is much greater in heaven. Just do it. And, and you're, you're, you will be rewarded for it. It's an attitude shift when you realize that people are not here to serve you. You're here to serve everyone else. And that's really our mission statement so that we can serve our community. And how can we serve them? How can we bless them? And, and how can we just, if, how can we bless them if not a single person comes to this church? How can we bless them? That's what it's about. How can we make a difference in the, the community that around us? The Heavenly Father has got each one of us a job to do. And by the way, an unhealthy church is when a few people are doing just everything. I mean, that's, that's a messed up family. Like if your mama has to do everything, she has to pick up the clothes, she has to put everything away, she has to, she has to cook, clean, she has to run you all over the place, and you got, you're old enough to get around for yourself. I'm telling you, you're doing your children a huge disfavor. That's a messed up family. Children have to take responsibility. In a family, people have to take responsibility. If, if you're a husband or a wife and you're doing everything and there's nothing else, that's messed up. Same thing within a church. We are a family. And it's messed up family if only a couple people are doing everything. So, how, what's a healthy family? A healthy family is whenever everybody realizes what God has called them to and they're doing it. And everybody has a small job to do. And I believe that if you're a member of a church, God's got a job for you. He has something for you. And it ain't just sitting in a pew. It's actually doing something that's serving other people. I talked about in, in the beginning, whenever way back, whenever we talked about uh, uh, the, the basket and giving that out, that Rick Warren, I, I think, said it best. He talked about spiritual gifts, S, right? Every one of you have special gifts. And we did a little survey for that. If you want it, I can get it to you and you can do it again. Or those of you who didn't do it. Anyway. <laughs> but you take it and it finds out what, what, what is your spiritual gift? What are you at? And then your heart. What are you passionate about? Every one of you are passionate about something. And finding out where that is and how can you use it. Your abilities. Okay. Yet now, my, my daughter was up here singing. She got that from her mama. If I would leave this microphone on and we were singing these praise songs and I sang it out, most of you would be, oh my gosh, who is on the microphone? Because <laughs> that gift did not come from me. So I don't have that ability. To put me on the praise team would not be where you want me to be. I guarantee you that. Personality. We're all different. We all have a personality. We, we all have different things and experiences. We've all experienced different things. And God never wastes a hurt. God will allow some of the things you've gone through to help others go through different things. So, I sent out an email <laughs> to people. And out in the foyer, there is a teams, right? Uh, different types of teams. And you can sign up for that. You can put yourself on a team. And I want you to pray about it. Just like I said, where, where, do, where do I fit? And instead of, uh, you know, I, I've been at churches, I've pastored churches where they get together with committees. And they go, okay, we got, we got the personnel committee. Claude, you're on it. Um, 
need you on it, need you on it. You know what I mean? And, and, and you just put a bunch of people on it, and they have no passion for it. They don't want to meet. They don't want to go through it, you know. All right, we got this. We got it. We got to have so many committees, so y'all have to be on it. So someone has to, to take the, the sword, right? Take the knife. I, I did it last time. It's your turn now. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to do that. We definitely do not want to do that. What we want to do is have people where they want to be. So I come up with these teams. And the, the first one's the planning team. The planning team is like the coordinator. For, some of you guys have great organizational skills. You just do. That is your gift. You're, you're organized. And you're the one that all the other teams come together and we, they say, hey, we want to do this. And you, you're in charge of the calendar. You're like, okay, we're going to plug this in. We're going to have a special emphasis and all this thing. I can do everything, but I don't want to. Because <laughs> it doesn't go very well and nothing really gets accomplished the way it should if, if one person does everything. So that fellow... That, that planning team gets together with the other teams and they develop the calendar for the year. They put everything on it. The next one is the fellowship team. Uh, you'll be putting together events. Now, this is an internal. So there's internal and external. A fellowship is internal. It's for us. It's so that we can get together as a family and celebrate all that God's doing. We can get to know each other. We can break bread together. We can do all kinds of... It's all internal. So the fellowship is... How can we as a church, you know, uh, put together things that will bring us together? Outreach and events. You'll be planning special outreach, external events that help us reach out to the community, that helps us find a place where we can serve. Now, in the outreach teams, that's whenever I'm talking about, hey, we can have an Easter egg hunt. If you like to do fun, that is a great place for you to be. And... We will support you and we'll, we'll go out and we'll do these, these fun outreach things. Missions team. Some of you have a heart for missions. I talked about that last week, right? We went over a whole bunch of, of missions that, that we're getting involved in. You're going to be the key point. You're going to be the point person for that. And, and if you're on that team, your team is going to say, how can we come alongside these ministries? By the way, I want to clarify something for you because I found out just, just through the thing. Every dime you give to this church, a percentage of that goes to those missions. That is not a separate uh, offering that we're taking. When you give to the church, it automatically goes out to that mission. Okay? So uh, there's a little confusion. How do we give to this mission or that mission? You can do that. But I want you to know that when you give, you're already given to it. You're already supporting that, that mission. So you're going to be a part of of a mission team that's all about that ground and maintenance team we have a beautiful facility but it requires to be kept up right and some of you are, are gifted in that area you just you, you just are yeah i i am not a uh, a carpenter my wife will tell you that um, if you come to our house and look at our kitchen that i tore apart eight months ago to to rebuild you would know that <laughs> But, but God has entrusted us and he's given us this place and we need to take care of it and show the world what, what we think it's about. And you will be part of what visitors see when they pass by. You'll be a, a part of making a difference. There's an old saying, it's still true. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. And I guarantee you the first impression is what people see. They won't get to know how wonderful you are. You are a wonderful, loving family. But they'll never see that if they don't get past that first initial impression. You're going to make that happen. Children and youth teams, all right? Um, some of you have a passion for children and youth. And we're, we're going to have a meeting tonight, the next generation, where we're talking about that and how we're going to reach out and how we're going to... De and we're developing this, this program for families and uh, we're having a meeting tonight that's going to go over that at 6 p.m. All of you are invited. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the final one is a worship experience team. The music, the visuals, everything. So those are just some teams that are out there. See, I don't want to just do a sermon and then say, okay, go serve. <laughs> I want to give you an opportunity, an application, something that you can do 
to make a difference as we go forward and we fill our mission and where you might be. And I want you to pray about that because, again, I don't want you on. I'm not going to go and say, I think you would be great for this. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. What I want is you to go, man, I'd love to do that. Or I think I have the abilities to make a difference in this. Because then you become passionate about it. And that's what I want. I want passionate people serving in the capacity that God gave them to serve. And I guarantee you, somewhere in there, he has called you. Serving on a team doesn't mean that you have to do everything either. It means that you plan things. And you help people understand what's coming up and what opportunities are there for me to be a part of this. Um, so uh, as, as we go forward, I'm, I'm going to ask you to come alongside, be part of a team. Let's, let's, let's reach the world for Christ. And we can do it. The more organized we become, the more focused we become, the more impactful we become. So remember, Christ did not come into this world to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that uh, today you will just work with our hearts, Father God, in the capacities that you have called us to be in. Father, as we move forward, as we're coming out of this, this uh, COVID environment where everybody's just kind of hunkered down and father god we relaunch into these things and get back on the vision of of knocking on the doors and reaching out to every member of of the community where we began and just covid just kind of stopped us in the midst of it lord i pray that you will help us to to refocus to get back on why we're here why we originally came here and Lord, uh, help us to find a place where we need to serve. And Lord, I, I pray that even in this verse, what you said, that you gave your life for us. Father God, I hope that is impactful as we go through this Lent season. We begin to think about that, about the sacrifice that you actually made for us. And what that means and the salvation that we have and the salvation that we can have if we only place our faith and our trust in you. So, Father God, meet us where we are. You know our hearts. You see us deep. You know everything within us. So, Father God, expose us and help us to know. And we just pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.